Great, thank you, Adam. And then as a reminder to everybody, um, we do record one site meeting a month uh, so people can check in in case they missed. Uh, because this one is being recorded, we also understand sometimes that has a chilling effect on things that people want to volunteer because it's being recorded, but you know, just bear that in mind, it is for everybody's benefit. Uh, I think we're also joined by Lawrence and I see two board members, but hey, go ahead, Lawrence. Absolutely, my name is Lawrence Sue. I'm the other business rep. Nice to meet y'all. Great, very good. You got to unmute. <laughs> hey, sorry, I had a, wait, a bug floating around. Um, I'm Mary Beth Rogers. I am on the SEMA executive board as a member at large. Nice to see everybody. This is a really big, big, good sized group. Mm -hmm. And you said you saw another board member on there, Zeb? I thought I saw Jesse on here, but I don't see him right now. So, Jesse, if you're there, unmute. If not, uh, I miss saw. Looks like not. Um, just as a reminder, your um, e-board folks that are from the hospital are uh, Jesse Castaneda, as well as uh, Jim Piazza. Okay, well, I'll get the agenda posted one more time in chat, and then we'll get underway. Um, as always, we have, um, this is usually a large site meeting, we have 84 people. Um, so folks are muted. Um, we'll pause after agenda items for questions. Um, it'll be easier for us if you put those in group chat for everyone to see rather than uh, messaging myself or, or Zeb directly, in which case we might miss it. Um, so first item we have on the agenda is something that um, I know Zeb Lawrence and I have been getting a lot of emails about uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, this has been something folks are receiving in the mail. Um, they're, they're, you would call them kind of anti-union mailers. And folks have been asking what those are. They have your name on them, they're addressed to you. So it'll say, you know, dear Adam Cole, SEMA OE3 union member, here's a message to you, right? And what they are is they're advocating for folks to um, drop membership in their union. Um, this is something that folks that are union members can expect to receive every handful of years. Where they come from is there are conservative political groups that make FOIA requests of local government employers um, or state or federal government employers. So they go to the county of Santa Clara, right? And they say, freedom of information, I want you to give me the home address of all your, all your union members, right? And then they print up mailers and they send them off. And they're usually framed as something along the lines of give yourself a raise or something, stop stop paying union dues. They really ramped up after the Janus Supreme Court hearing a number of years ago. The goal is to right, reduce union membership around the country, um, undercut you know organizations that make political donations to politicians that support working families or progressive politics, right? That's, that's generally the goal. Um, and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's unfortunately something that's ramped up in, in recent years, right? Particularly, like I said, since Janice. Um, if you haven't received one yet, you'll likely be receiving one in, in the coming weeks. If you have any questions about it, you're welcome to reach out to, to your union rep. Um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of where they come from. I think the most recent one I saw said, you know, give yourself a $3,000 raise or something like that by not paying doing your dues. I would just note that seems a pretty, pretty good deal if that's the case, because our, our dues are less than a third of that per year, and it's a flat rate. Um, so yeah, folks will be receiving one if you haven't gotten one yet. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to, to any one of your reps. We'll be happy to happy to chat with you. Um, anything you want to add on that, Zebra Lords? No. Okay. Um, yeah, you explained it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's jump ahead. Um, next item we had on the agenda, and I'll get some uh, highlights posted in chat here. Our changes to the. Changes to the vaccine mandate exemption process. Uh, this is something we've been hoping to be done talking about for a little while. Um, unfortunately, new things keep coming up. So we have it on the agenda to let folks know what's what's changed in the last couple of weeks uh, just recently with this, with a particular impact for folks in the hospital setting. Um, so as everyone will recall, we've talked about this a lot in recent months, the county's policy or practice they came out with for the vaccine exemption mandate. Um, was for folks who were approved with exemptions. They were classified as either low, medium, or high risk, kind of tier one, two, or three. Folks that were lower, medium risk got to mask and test. Folks who were high risk are on leave without pay looking for a job somewhere else in the county, right? What's changed here is that, um, I, I think from my perspective, from SEMA's perspective, HHS and our hospitals did a good job with that low, medium, high kind of tier system in the first round of doing this. 
Um, but in the last couple of weeks, um, county council has gone back through and done a reevaluation of a number of positions. Um, and what we've seen is a recategorization of people from, from tier two or medium risk to high risk, right? And so what that means is it shifts somebody from saying, um, you can mask and test to now you're on, you're on leave without pay um, indefinitely pending finding a job somewhere else, right? Um, so as of a couple of weeks ago, we had only a couple of SEMA members that were in that position, we've been able to find, you know, solutions for, for other folks that were in that position. Um, however, we now have some unknown number of people that have been recategorized as tier three, as was the case before, you know, the county is continuing to refuse to provide any lists of impacted folks uh, to any union, SEMA, SCIU, RMPA, or what have you. So if you're someone that's in one of those positions that's been recategorized, um, please reach out to your SEMA reps so we can assist you. Um, there's a couple of things we've been doing. One is pushing for appropriate reevaluations of um, positions where they shouldn't be categorized high, and they, they can be medium, or if they are appropriately categorized as high risk, which, which a lot of SEMA positions are gonna be, right? A lot of our engineer nurse manager position, right? Um, you're gonna be on the floor. Um, for those that are appropriately categorized as high risk, um, and we'll be able to assist you in, in locating a position somewhere else in the county, right? And the advocacy is that SEMA positions should go to SEMA folks first. Um, so again, the same same caveat that we always give whenever we're talking about this subject, um, SEMA is an overwhelmingly vaccinated unit, right? More than 95% now. Um, and also overwhelmingly pro-vaccine, right? Um, and nothing that we're saying here, um, negates those 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 facts in any way right um, but we need to ensure that our folks are being being treated fairly and appropriately especially those who have been approved for religious or medical exemptions and are going through through this process um anything you'd like to add zeb or lawrence or any questions from members no just that what you said is that this has been a long process and i think we are closing the you know, coming to a close on it. But yeah, other than that, we just want to answer questions. Yeah. Um, for folks who were at the previous Board of Supervisors meeting, you may have seen that there's been some scrutiny from the board lately from a couple members on there, um, both Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg on county administration about this process. This is a process that administration came up with on their own. Um, and particularly RMPA, who has significantly more folks impacted by this than, than SEMA or I think SCIU even. This has been a large concern for them. There's dozens and dozens, dozens of nurses out on leave without pay right now. Um, has been advocating for some review of this by the board. I think it's very unlikely that the board takes any action to overrule the county's current, current practice as it's unfolding on this. Um, but it is, it is good to see um, the board taking some hand and giving some level of scrutiny on this process, which we've advocated and said has been uh, poorly handled a number of ways. Okay. Um, well, let's jump ahead to the next item. Would you like to take the sub on pandemic pay, the wrap up and conclusion? Sure, thank you. So in fact, while, while I'm doing that, if you or Lawrence could post the link to the county website, that would be very helpful, I think, for people to, to be able to refer to. So, as all of you know, um, the pandemic pay uh, has appeared on the pay advice uh, of December 3rd. So all of you should have already seen that. And that actually, although we've referred to it as hero pay, what you will see it reflected on your pay advice as is pandemic pay. And um, if you haven't received that, there is likely an error assuming that you meet the criteria. And the criteria is that you were working for the county between the dates of, I, I'm going to have to flub this, I think it was Janu uh, June through November. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, June, June 28th through November 16th. Thank you. Is. And so as long as you worked for the county in a, in a paid status during that period of time, you would be eligible for the uh, hero or pandemic pay. As I mentioned, it's been referred to as hero pay. You'll see it on your pay advice as pandemic pay. For typical folks, it is $2,500, typical meaning that you are full-time and you were employed with the county. There are um, pro rata payments that are available, especially at the hospital, right? And I realize this is a BMC meeting. There are some folks where perhaps you have a 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 code 
and you would then be compensated appropriately, right? 0.5, nice clean, you just cut the 2,500 and a half, 1250 allocated to you. As a reminder, it is what your code is, not what you are working as. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you are a 0.5, but you typically work 0.6, you are still eligible for a 0.5 half of that $2,500 um, payment. Mm -hmm. uh, also a couple of just reminder points on this. We uh, did contemplate if we wanted to negotiate with the county um, to try to get something that was percentage based because obviously SEMA is one of the highest earning unions in the county, we might be, I think we're edged out certainly by the physician's union, right? Um, and it's arguable whether or not a GAA, General Attorneys Association or so forth makes more, but very specialized subgroups, right? Certainly in terms of a mainstream union, um, we would be at the top. So the percentage benefits us. We opted to not advocate for that because politically it seemed like that wouldn't be something we would be successful at. And we'd likely be just regarded as trying to grab, make a cash grab. So um, while we did contemplate that, we discussed it at the board level uh, with our internal board, rather the SEMA e board. We opted not to. Hopefully, the twenty five hundred dollars uh, after taxes. You know, you're looking at depending on your circumstances, eighteen hundred, sixteen hundred, two thousand, whatever it might be, helps you out for the holidays. It's a nice thank you, and I hope you all are appreciative of it. Um, as staff, sadly, we are not eligible for it. Uh, also, the Board of Supervisors and Dr. Smith removed themselves from uh, getting this bonus. Uh, anything else, Lawrence or Adam, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, just, just a couple of things. Where we've had niche cases come up, um, the initial communication we got from the county on this um described the, the qualification period as just being those june to november dates subsequent faqs for example and communication from the county um, that you'll see for example in that that faq i linked to there in chat added another qualifying criteria which was and beyond paid status effective um the the, the date that it's dispersed um so we have a couple folks who timed retirements for, for after that November 16th date and then did not receive it. Um, I'm aware of a couple right now. Um, if you happen to know anybody who retired in that date and is concerned, um, they're welcome to reach out for us. That's an issue they'd, you know, we'd, we'd be willing to advocate for them on. Unclear right now is if we're gonna be successful in, in convincing the county they should qualify for it, having worked here through the entirety of the pandemic. Um, but we'll have some shot given that that was something that was not in the initial communication to SEMA as far as, how folks qualify. And it, it's just kind of somewhat mysterious to what the functionality of that November 16th date was, if for all intents and purposes, you also had to be here two weeks after that date in order to receive it. Um, just not clear why that November 16th date was initially communicated to, to SEMA or anybody else as the, the end date for qualification. Um, I want to pull us back to the, the previous topic briefly before we, we move on to the third one. I got a couple private questions here from folks uh, with questions about uh, booster shots and if the county is likely to enforce um, booster shots as part of their, their vaccine mandate policy. So uh, I think folks may recall, you know, that's COVID times, you may, may forget, that was something that we raised early on in this process that we advocated strongly this question should be answered when the county first rolled out their vaccine mandate policy, right? The policy clearly leaves open the ability for them to say, yes, boosters are covered, we're requiring some definition of what fully vaccinated means. So if you change the underlying definition, then presumably that changes the requirement, right? Um, and the county said, well, we're not saying that right now and we're not gonna take a stance on booster shots right now, right? Um, that being said, I think we can, we can say a couple things just kind of based on how the mandate policies rolled out thus far about what's, what's likely to come in the future, right? So there's, there's two questions here. One is, will the county enforce booster shots broadly? And more specifically for folks in this group, um, will it be required for healthcare workers? And those may end up being different, right? Um, our healthcare workers will recall that there's authorization under um, the California Health Officers Order that's made different requirements for our healthcare workers, right? You guys were treated differently than the rest of county employees with regard to timelines for getting vaccinated um, and with regard to how people who got exemptions were treated, right? Um, so that there, there could be a divergence there. 
um, between our healthcare workers and, and, and the rest of the county. Um, the second thing I would say is we can kind of plot where Santa Clara County has been in its pandemic response measures compared to other nearby employers, right, with actions they've taken. And I, I think we've seen over the whole the whole period of the pandemic that we've kind of fallen in the middle as far as a more stringent and a more lax response um, in local municipalities. On the one side, we have city and county of San Francisco, which has been extremely stringent and ahead of everyone else in the measures they've been enforcing. On the other side, we'd have other counties like Alameda, for example, um, where we have nurses who, who have exemptions who are able to continue to work in, in, in patient care capacities, right, which we're not allowing, for example. Um, but I, I think it likely that we'd see, for example, San Francisco or some other counties nearby start to enforce boosters before it came online here. Um, and that would give us some, some kind of awareness and heads up. The other things that could change, right, would be at the national level, just a change to what fully vaccinated means. Um, the other thing we could see, like I said, is, is whether there's a health order specifically for California that impacts, impacts healthcare workers, uh, our folks in HHS. So unclear right now. Um, but I would definitely not be surprised if, if that happened, though we'd likely have some forewarning um, if, if that did change. Would you agree with that assessment, Zeb and Lawrence? Absolutely. Okay. No, I think that's spot on. Um, we had a question here. A question. Should, yeah. Yeah. Should sick time be used when an employee gets sick or some type of reaction after receiving the vaccine booster shot? So previously, you were able to use your COVID time, right? Everyone got over the course of the pandemic, a couple of weeks of COVID time, which was at was unbanked. It was a, a, a it was a couple of weeks spread over the the two years of the pandemic we've had so far, or the year and then an extension. Um, that that hasn't been extended again, um, so folks won't be able to use that. That time lapsed, I think, in August of this last year. That time ended. If you hadn't used it, it was use it or lose it. So moving forward, um, yes, you would you would you would be need you would need to use sick time um to to cover that um one of the early questions that we had in here is for anyone who just has you know what i think we would say are extremely rare but but possible side effects from the vaccine if, if you're off work for a while for some bad reason um particularly adverse effect um that that would be eligible under workers comp um is is, is what the county clarified early on in this that was something that came out during the, the meet and confer process as well though not really meet and confer, but the post-implementation meetings with SEMA on, on this topic. Um, so if you're out for a while, then you, you, you could be covered under workers' comp time, right? But for any, any kind of uh, run-of-the-mill reactions, likely, yes, you just, you'd just be using your sick bank for that. Yep. And we have had historical questions about, well, what happens if I'm out and I come back to the workplace? Um, I'm shifting gears back towards the hero pay. Um, someone just private message this question again. I thought we covered it, but maybe we didn't. What happens if I'm out and uh, for a portion of that and come back to the workplace, do I still get the full payment? The answer to that is yes. You get the full 2,500, whatever it is according to your, to your code. Most people, that's 2,500. Also, um, and we have dealt with this with a couple of people that if they are out at the time of the payment, that's the pay period of December 3rd, then you don't get it until you return to work. So let's pretend you work three pay periods or something, and now you're out on some long-term leave and not being paid at the moment or not, or not at work to receive the payment. You would get the pandemic pay upon your first pay period of return. So let's pretend your first day back, or your first pay period back is in February. That's when you would see the pandemic pay hit your paycheck. Mm -hmm. And again, I know Adam mentioned this. We got a lot of people on the call. If you can, please put the things in the public chat. It helps so everybody can see the can see the questions. Yeah. Uh, yes, there there is an option. Sorry, we had a question in chat for anyone on the phone. Is there an option to sell vacation time this year? So that's always an option every year. Um, what's the date for submission? Is it February? Let me look it up right now. I don't know it yeah. by heart. Um, so yes, there, there's a window once per year. I think it's sub you submit a request in January and it gets paid in February. Uh, Zeb, Zeb can check those dates real quick. Um, but yes, once per year, you're able to to cash out, um, able to cash out vacation. What that requires is that you've not taken more than three days of sick leave in the preceding year. Um, it used to be that you couldn't take any vacation. That was increased to, or sorry, it used to be you couldn't take any sick leave um, if you wanted to cash out. That was increased to you can't take more than three days in the the preceding year. 
um, with some caveats, the first two days of bereavement leave, for example, don't count um, towards that. And, and there's other caveats. Um, and the, all that information is in the contract, which is available on SEMA's page and the county's page, and, and folks should have a copy of that. And um, the, it's during the month of January to be paid in the month of February. So that's a good reminder to us, um, Adam and Lawrence, I'm going to put it on my calendar now. We need to remind people in January about their uh, sick time, their STO. Their STO, yeah. I'm going to put the uh, language here in chat. Most of you will not be interested in it, but just so you have it. Mm -hmm. That was something we learned during negotiations this last go around is I, I would say there's a surprisingly few number of people from my perspective that do cash out vacation. I think it was something, what was it? it was 100 folks or less in a given year, I think we saw an information request to No, I think it was like 200. It was It was just, 200? it was 100 something, yeah. Okay, 100 something. Um, but the, yeah. the boy, the amount of questions we get about it, you'd think like 500 people were taking it every year. Mm -hmm. um, Raji is asking, would that be for the year 2021? That's correct. So it's a backward looking usage of STO. And um, as long as you didn't use, you can see 24 hours of sick leave um, for the one year prior, that's the backwards time that it's looking at. And if you had COVID time off, that's not going to exempt you from cashing out STO, right? It needs to specifically be time from your sick leave bank. So things like the COVID time everyone got, things like ATO, which you could be using for a doctor's appointment or something, um, anything that's not coming from your sick leave bank won't count towards those days. It needs to be usage of sick leave in your Kronos on your paycheck um, is, is what's, what's measured. Hey, Lawrence, are you there? We, if, if you are, uh, well, I can answer this. We just discussed this the other day is why I was gonna ask Lawrence to cover this, is um, in fact, if it involves bereavement leave also, it does not count against your ability to cash out for STO as long as you don't dip into your sick time. So the first two days of bereavement leave come from no bank at all, right? The, or an imaginary bereavement bank, or if you want to think about it. Um, and then after that, up to five days, you can use your sick time. As long as you just use the two, the two phantom days, if you will, it doesn't impact your ability to cash out. And yes, it's it's taxable. Um, it's taxable income. Mm -hmm. uh, you missed your chance to shine, Lawrence. <laughs> I know. I was going to get extra credit points. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting the, the next item in chat here. We have uh, a class, classification committee for 2022 and the application process. Um, so just a quick quick refresher on this. We talked a whole lot about this last year, but just a quick reminder, we have a new classification study process that was bargained in the previous contract. Last year was the first year that we did it. Um, and what it is, is instead of submitting for a classification study for a salary review or for anything like that, whenever you want, instead SEMA submits in March. Um, and instead of having the unlimited number um, and a four-year completion turnaround time on average, it's we submit 30 studies and they're done within within a year. Um, so SEMA submitted uh, a batch of, it ended up being a little more than 30 actually that got through, um, but we, we submitted those back in March and they're, they're underway right now. I'll talk a little bit about the pending ones in a bit. Um, but we're gonna have our, our, our second window coming up in 2022. Um, so the way we handled that, that process last time is we sat a SEMA classification committee. Um, we had a couple of folks from, from the hospitals that were on there. I think about 10 members and myself and Zeb. Um, and we had folks submit their applications to us at the end of January. And then our committee reviewed them before submission to SEMA, before submission to ESA in, in, in the middle of March. Um, and what we did with those was we, we kind of ranked everything on, on low, medium, or high strength, how likely is this to result in a monetary increase for a classification or for a member um, as for, as for a reclass, because we want to have studies that are going to be successful. But then additionally, we met with folks to help them submit stronger um, classification studies, right, so they have a, a, a better chance of success. And I think the level of usage we had and number of applications we had were such that anything we evaluated as high or even medium strength uh, made it into that batch of 30. Um, I don't know if that's just the level of interest we'll have again this year or if there'll be more, more competition, but I think all the, all the good ones got in and we were able to, to, to strengthen those that, that were put in. So we'll have the same process this year. Classification committee is going to be reset. Um, and anyone that's not here, we'll have some more seats probably. Um, 
but the, the forms for that are available on the county county intranet um, and they can be, can be filled out now. Like I said, we'll ask for submission to CMS classification committee um, at the end of January. Um, and then we'll be reviewing them and submitting to, to ESA in, in March. Um, the one thing I would add, and I'll get this posted in chat in just a little bit. Um, let me go to the next item. But we did a, a quite comprehensive training around this time last year. Um, about the classification study process. And it co covers a few things. One, it just covers kind of the formalities of the process and how it goes, what's eligible for a classification study, what the potential results can be from a classification study, timelines, all that kind of stuff. So the, the procedural kind of questions of how the process goes, um, but then more relevant for someone who's gonna wanna go through this, um, it gives kind of my assessment and Zeb's assessments, some of our members who have been through this process for a lot on how, what ESA cares about and finds persuasive when they're evaluating classification studies, right? Um, and, and how you wanna use that information when you're describing your position, when you're describing what you think your position does, when you're trying to determine, am I out of step with the market rate? What kind of information will they find compelling? How do I do some preliminary research on that to determine if I might be out of step with the market rate? All that kind of stuff is in there. Um, it's about an hour and a half training. Like I said, I'll get the link posted in chat in a little bit. While it's on SEMA's YouTube page, it's it's set as an unlisted video, um, which means you need to have the link to it directly. Most stuff we have on the YouTube page is publicly available um, because that has kind of some of our insights and inside baseball about what we think ESA cares about and how HR evaluates these. We've kind of kept that a little bit off the radar, um, but we have to get the link in here so so folks can watch it, watch it directly. Um, yeah, I will, I will pause there and I'll get that in there, see if we have any questions, and then we'll talk about where we're at with, with pending classification studies and where um, where those are at right now. Uh, but see if we have any questions first. Are you getting anything? Yeah, you see the general comment there? By Hind? Yeah. Um, so 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 last year, Hind, we had ESA wasn't done with the actual the, the what ended up being the the formal form for submission last year because they didn't they didn't come up with a new form until the end of like February. So we had folks use the the old fashioned PCQ. Um, the the new form is a little bit better. Um, but we're we're just going to have um, members fill out the, the form that ESA is going to want this go around. I agree. It would be nice to have something that's a lot more bare bones for salary request because those are much more straightforward and there's less relevant information. But because members are going to have to fill out ESA's form regardless to submit at some point um, prior to March, uh, we're, we're going to continue to have them fill it out. Um, but yeah, it's something for us to to continue to address with ESA if we can get something more streamlined for for salary reviews. So this was a generic private question, and I guess we can all kind of answer this. Um, and Lawrence, maybe you want to walk people through a little bit of what we're doing right now for the for a particular study we're working on, uh, but what makes a good classification study? So do you want to talk a little bit about how you're assessing one of the studies we're doing at uh, Lawrence? Absolutely. So a lot of you folks might be having, you know, a position or job spec that has not been reviewed or updated for many years, whether it be to the 80s, the 90s, and 2000s. And so your job is constantly evolving. Uh, as the market changes, as services also change too as well, uh, it's very important to make sure that, hey, is what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, my task, uh, and so forth, especially as someone who supervises or what have you, is that reflected in my job specs? So what makes a really good classification study is that if you could prove that, hey, Look, look, look at what the county says I'm supposed to be doing. I'm doing something completely different. Or I feel that look at how much Alameda County, San Mateo County, San Francisco County, and so forth, they're paying their, for example, if, if one of your positions is a management analyst, right? They're, play, they're paying their management analyst much more than what Santa Clara County does. So when you're able to assess the differences in job specs in terms of how it's changed, or even when it comes to compensation to make sure that Santa Clara County is competitive. These are just some of the many factors that we take to look at uh, so that we can, first of all, make sure we have accurate job specs that reflects the work that you do, and also to make sure you get compensated uh, at market rate fairly. 
I would put a couple of quick caveats on there. So that, I think that's a good analysis of what could cause a job spec to need to be updated. The, the only bit I would add on to that is that SEMA's interest um, is going to be to, to have class studies completed where the result is not just a change to the classification, you know, job description, for example, but also a monetary increase, a salary increase, a reclassification to a higher classification for our folks. Um, and, and, and there will be some level of prioritization for, for those types of studies that go through. So for example, if your job has changed substantially and that you've taken on a lot of clerical duties, um, in addition to your supervisory or managerial duties in the last 10 years, that for example, is not gonna be a strong argument for a class study. Well, it, it could be, but it's not one that we're likely gonna wanna submit to ESA because they're not gonna find the addition of a lot of lower level duties that pay on average less than the type of work you're doing as persuasive for um, I should be reclassed to something higher or maybe need a market rate adjustment or something like that, right? Um, but but yeah, that, that information and more, everything Lauren said and I talked about there is, is expounded upon at length in, in the, the training that we did. Um, and that's, that's available in chat there. Um, I'll post the link one more time. I'm getting a few more questions in. Um, let me check these real quick. So a question from Stacy about- Go ahead, yeah. What about taking on enterprise uh, responsibilities? Um, yes, um, with with some caveats. So, so for folks that aren't in the hospitals um, directly, what enterprise means is when when the, the county acquired O'Connor and St. Louis hospitals. Some of our positions, for example, I I work in compliance. You know, I'm I'm the director of compliance and I used to just care about compliance work that was happening at VMC, but we don't have an equivalent position for what I do at O'Connor St. Louis. Um, so now I have responsibility for those areas too. So that's, that's arguably increased the scope and complexity um, of your position because now you, you, you supervise multiple areas as opposed to just one. So it, it unfortunately the answer is gonna be, it depends somewhat for example, those kind of changes, if you're in the program manager series, are are very relevant, right? Because one of the things the program manager series cares about is how many areas in the county do you touch, how many other departments do you deal with, how many sites are you at. Those kind of things are relevant. Um, it'll be a little bit less persuasive for other positions that may already describe their their work in that way as not limited to a single site. Some of our director positions, for example, don't don't care about that. Um, so very likely, yes, enterprise duties are relevant. Um, and, and furthermore, I would say we will generally find support from executives if they agree you've taken on enterprise duties. Um, that, that was a project that, that um, some of our hospital executive staff were gonna take on prior to COVID. Um, there was a general sense and agreement that post acquisition, they tried to make a sense of who was gonna absorb enterprise duties and make appropriate classification adjustments. Um, but an expectation they were gonna miss some folks and that they'd do a second pass on that, um, that that kind of disappeared um, due to COVID and economic damage that happened, you know, a year and a half ago as, as a project they were gonna undertake with SEMA classifications. Um, but, but, but it's indicative as a recognition that we, you know, if, if that was missed, that there will likely be support from, you know, executive staff for for a study that we can use seamless bandwidth for. Uh, so, so yes, and you're welcome to reach out to, to myself or Zeb or Lawrence, it's appropriate for your rep. Um, one of the things that we do, like I said, for folks who submit through seamless process is if it, if it looks like there's there's you know kind of fertile ground for a study there and something might not be fully explored, um, you know, we'll reach out and sit down with folks individually and see how we can how we can frame this in the most advantageous possible way. Um, so um, to address uh, your question quickly, I did in, in chat a little bit, Diane. Um, also, something else, th the biggest challenge in trying to find um, other pay, comparable pay, is usually not the availability of the information. A quick internet search can find that. It's when there's a complicated code, finding a like classification. Right. So if we have somebody here that might be, for example, I don't know what the, you know, urology clinic coordinator, and we have to find an equivalent code, but no other hospitals call it that. That's where we run into to a challenge. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's just, hey, I'm looking at a, at a clin nurse too. What does a clin nurse to do? 
this thing's maybe that aligns with the clin nurse one in this hospital, a clin nurse three somewhere else, fine, got it. That's less difficult to do. Um, did you want to handle uh, Ursula's question or do you want or Lawrence or Adam? Yeah, I, I will take it just just real quick. Um, and and what we're, we're kind of getting into some of the content that you'll find in that training, but best place to look for salary information is going to be transparentcalifornia.com. This is actually kind of humorously related to what we were talking about in the beginning with those anti-union mailers that are going out. This website was initially created by, again, conservative funded political groups who compile the information via FOIA requests about government employee salaries. The idea was that that was going to turn voters against public employees. Um, by highlighting the high salaries folks make, um, it didn't work because, by and large, you know, public sector employees aren't aren't you know um, the highest paid folks in, in any given community, right? And instead, what it's what it's become is a very good resource for folks to to argue for higher salaries because it, it makes transparency and salary information publicly available, right? Um, which is just frequently to the benefit of the employee and not the employer, right? So backfired a little bit from the groups that put it up, and and we make good use of it. Um, for example, when when SEMA is sitting down for a, 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 a you know, our, our meet and confer process of a, a salary study, that's that's one of the first places we'll look. Um, and, and it's fairly detailed. You can search by by employer, by classification, all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the, the county cares less about nearby private sector employers. They don't see themselves as competing with private sector employers um, because the benefit schema is just so much worse. And presumably, if you're working in the public sector, it's also partly that you how you is where you want to work. You know, you have a desire for public service. Um, so it's, it's, it's just second tier relevant compared to other nearby public employers is how they would see it. Um, I might want to address, so there's a question from Ursula for anybody on the phone. Um, if you're being encouraged by your director to submit through the, through your department, which really means through executives rather than through SEMA, because that'll be faster. What route is actually faster? Um, Good, good question, and that answer varies depending on what type of study you're wanting to put in. So if all you want is an admin spec revision for your classification or for the classification of someone who reports to you, an admin spec revision being all we're looking to do is update the content of the job description, not looking to change anybody's classification, and we're not looking for a salary review. If that's all you want, yes, you will get a quick turnaround time from, from ESA compared to going through SEMA's process. Secondarily, because of that, that rubric I mentioned before, we care about studies that are going to result in pay increases for our members. That's, that's part of the goal with this process. Um, we're we're going to be disinclined to approve a lot of just purely admin spec revisions, right? Um, and the second question of which one's going to be quicker. So historically, I would have said probably submitting through your department if you have strong executive support. Um, would be the same speed or quicker. Um, with the new language, though, we have a guaranteed one-year turnaround time. I have not seen any, many, if any, executive-sponsored reviews turn around in, in less than a year. It, it could be possible um, that with a lot of pressure, you know, a, a given executive could turn around a study very quickly from ESA. Your department's promising you that that's going to happen. I would want to know that, for example, Paul Lorenz specifically says this is my top priority for all of HHS. Get this done now, ESA. And if it's not like that level of priority, no, they're, they're not going to turn this around in less than a year. Um, and I would say it'll be faster to submit through through SEMA. The, the, the other, and, and, and that's just because County executives generally have very little influence over what what ESA prioritizes and does. Right, Th their response to anybody lower than you know maybe the five or six most important people in the county, right, in the executive level, is going to be you know we have our process and we're working, right. And thank you for letting us know your priorities. Um, that being said, if, if if you have departmental support to submit through them, the upside is you could submit now, right, and, and get that clock ticking sooner. Um, Whereas, you know, we're, we're kind of close to the deadline now, but if you were asking me that in April of 2022 and you'd missed the window, um, then I would say, yeah, you're going to be tacking on at least a year just to submit next year. To see that. So that's 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 kind of the context um, to evaluate if you want to submit through them. I would just say it's also that there's some benefit to submitting through your department because if they're willing to um, submit it as an executive sponsored request, then it doesn't take a, a, a slot that a SEMA member that doesn't have that support. 
would otherwise need. Any any questions that left for you, um, Ursula? Great, great. Okay. And so I, ju I just want to add, you know, a quick takeaway on that. We have a contractually guaranteed one year turnaround time. We're going through our first year of that language. Um, we'll see if that in fact happens or if we have to go to arbitration to enforce that. So assuming we don't, and we in fact have the one year turnaround time, that's wonderful news for everybody because even executive classification studies in years of old, like wind back five years, would take somewhere between nine to 12 months. So if we in fact get a year turnaround time, great news for everybody, apply through the SEMA process and then have the executives jump up and down and weigh in on it. Um, so let me, uh, let me jump up to the next and I see we're getting some questions, some off, off topic questions and we'll get to those at the end. Um, I've gotten a lot of direct questions about what about my pending study? Um, so that, that falls into two categories, pending studies from submission from before last year, and then studies that were submitted as part of last year's window. So we still have couple dozen probably pending studies from before the new process, right? Ones that uh, I think everyone would have hoped would have been done by now and still aren't done. Um, healthcare program analyst is one we get a lot of questions about quite frequently, for example. Um, you know, we, we have another number of other hospital relevant ones that are, that are still out there pending as well. Um, something that we continue to push on ESA a monthly with. We're seeing progress on some of them, um, whether it's desk audits being scheduled or turnaround times and actually completed studies. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, we, we've had a couple studies that we've had, we've pushed quite hard on recently to say, we've escalated up to, to John Mills or Jeff to say, absolutely appalling that this study has been pending four years and you guys have lost the information multiple times on this and had to restart and do multiple desk audits and been quite frustrated to see that then we've just gotten a prompt response from ESA with an extremely cursory study um, saying um, no findings are not going to do anything when there's obviously a very good basis for a study so so it's unfortunately a little bit little bit touchy um, trying to make sure that we get things appropriately prioritized without um, incentivizing them to just respond that, hey, we did a study and there's no changes recommended, right? Um, so we're gonna continue to push on all of those studies. We have, like I said, a couple dozen ones still pending from before the, this last year, um, but we're seeing progress on, on a number of those. So hopefully we get them wrapped up fairly quickly. Um, and that's, that's where we're at with the long pending ones. For ones submitted last year, um, we're starting to see most of most folks who are pending one um, have now had their desk audits or having their desk audits. Um, I've had a lot of meetings this last month with people in preparation for desk audits. If you're part of that group and they're saying, hey, uh, Zeb, I'd like to come sit down with you for a desk audit next week, a couple hours. Um, what they're generally trying to do is say, okay, and Zeb's a job description, he, de he described himself as the chief executive for operating engineers. Let me see if that corresponds to what Zeb actually does on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, so they're, they're kind of checking, but it's an opportunity for us to, um, you know, d d describe and demonstrate the duties that are being done in the most advantageous way, right? So your rep is happy to meet with you prior to a desk audit to help kind of walk through best practices for that. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, for folks who are going through strictly salary studies, like just, just a salary review, um, generally a desk audit won't be done for those. It depends. Sometimes when a salary review is underway, they'll consider expanding the scope of the study. If they find a basis for it, then they'll schedule a desk audit, um, but they don't have to do one necessarily. They can just look at strictly salary data and make a determination, which should mean they go quicker. Um, so yeah, we're seeing progress on those. And we, like I said, we have the one year, one year turnaround time on those. So, you know, hopefully that doesn't become a fight <laughs> when the date comes around, but, but we'll see. Um, and yeah, specifically the salary study for, for, for AMA, I mean, no, no separate date. That's, that's one of the ones that was submitted last year as part of our window. Um, no specific update other than, 
you know, we've, we've addressed, you know, and reminded folks of the timeline over at ESA and advocated that if they have anyone who's not going to be able to meet that, that they reassign studies to folks that will be able to turn them around by their deadline. Um, so once the date gets, gets close, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have that topic up again, but contracts as it has to be done. Is AMA associate management analyst? Yes. Okay. Yes. <sighs> Um, because hospital, it might be something medical assistant, but you never know, right? <laughs> against medical advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true too, right? Released AMA. Yes, I, I, I got some private questions about specific studies. Um, I, I, I think the generic information we gave spoke to any specific studies you have too, whether it's part of the, the batch that was submitted last year, in which case we have a one-year deadline. And if it's from prior, we don't have a one-year deadline, but we're seeing at least progress on, on a handful um, every couple of months moving forward. Okay, let's, uh, let me jump to the next topic on the agenda before we get back to any of the off topic questions. I think the last topic, Adam, is the classification committee. That's what we've been talking about. I think the last, and I, I think we hit everything on the, the classification committee and pending studies, um, unless you had something else you wanted to raise up. Nope. Okay, then the last one is the um, state membership meeting, just FYI on it. Um, would you mind covering that, Zeb, while I answer a few private questions? In chat? Sure thing. Uh, so we, we do have, um, a, our bylaws require an annual state of the membership meeting. And we are having one. Uh, we haven't formally announced it yet, but it is going to be happening um, in the later part of February. Uh, and what this meeting is, um, for an example, actually, if someone has been to one before, um, I would invite you to unmute, raise your hand and I can call on you. You can say what was covered. If not, I'll just talk about what, what the bylaws were. I'll give you a couple seconds here. Anyone? Scan and don't see any hands. All right, you get to listen to me. <laughs> okay, so uh, the state of the membership um, is a, an opportunity for your reps to check in with you, but mostly it's about the board. And what the board does is the board checks in with the membership and says, here's what's going on in the union. Here's what we've done over the last year. Here's what our goals are for the next one to three years, right? It's whatever the board chooses. It could be even five years out, right? Um, and here's what we hope to achieve. And also it's an opportunity for the board to report back on their various committee activities, right? So this is where professional development can talk about what it's done and take soundings of the membership. PAC can give a political action committee can give some updates and talk about their plans and upcoming important elections. Uh, member services, liaison committee, scholarship, so on, can all address what they have done over the past year, how that served the greater vision and interest of SEMA. And it's also a chance for you all as members to weigh in and say like, hey, I know it wasn't one of your priorities, but I really appreciate how we got uh, uh, no layoffs, right? Or I really appreciated the the hero pay or whatever it might be, or I'm really upset. I thought we should have had a percentage-based hero pay and we didn't get that. And board, you need to fight for that. And reps, you, Zeb and Adam and Lawrence, you guys need to fight for that more next time. Whatever it might be, right? Both good and bad. It's a way to take a pulse of the membership, explain informationally where we are, what our priorities are, and then get feedback about what did and didn't work. So anyway, that's going to be coming up um, in mid-February. It is an an uh, audio video only, Zoom only state of the membership. It will be recorded and it will be um, put out for everybody. Uh, but just as a reminder, most of our meetings, I'm still anticipating this, Adam, unless we get other direction from the board, we will start having uh, board uh, these types of meetings in person. Um, although that, that general um, membership meeting, state of the membership meeting, that's required annually by the bylaws, that will be remote. I'm anticipating our site meetings will start in the month of January, coming back to be in person. We'll social distance, we're mad, adhere to whatever guidelines we need to, um, and then we'll have that hybrid approach where we appear in person, but then we also uh, will webcast it so that people can still attend as you are now. And we'll see what happens, right? I mean, if, if 30, 40 people show up to the lower level conference room or wherever it is we end up having this, um, maybe it's RSC, maybe at SSA, it's at the new 353 building, whatever it is. If we end up having 10 people show up and everyone else is by Zoom, maybe it's not worth it. If we have 50 people show up like this meeting, 
we had 100 people at the height. Let's say we had 40 people show up in person and 60 show up online. Hey, great. That's a, that's a success for me. If we have something in 10 people show up in person and 90 show up online, that's telling me maybe we're not ready to go back to the, to the workplace. You look very quizzical, Adam. Was that at my comment or at something else? No, a, a message in chat. Oh, okay, you're like, mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's it for the state of the membership. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to cover, Adam? No, I think we 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 got through everything in the, the agenda. We got a couple minutes left. Um, so we'll just pause, see if there were scroll up, see if we missed any any particular questions. I think there was one about a Harvey Rose assessment. Um, so yeah, uh, Kathy was asking in chat, what about a Harvey Rose assessment of county operations at the hospital? So there at any one time, there are quite a few Harvey Rose assessments going on of various county departments and they become available when they're completed and they go before the board. Um, I haven't reviewed any specifically focused on the hospitals recently. Was there a recent one that became public and went in front of the board, Kathy? In, in which case, I, I can't speak to it not having read it, but we'll we'll have to read it as those are sometimes relevant and sometimes not for us, depending on their findings. And just generically, um, while it may not be uh, a, a, an issue for some of you, um, the board really has to take action on any of the Harvey Rose, right? So the, the, board, the board of supervisors receives the Harvey Rose audits and the associated recommendations. And then the board may take action that would impact your classifications, right? So if they got, if they got this big report and it said, guess what? All of your medical billers are being wildly misused. Here's how the industry uses them. The board may well receive that report and say, okay, ESA, I'm ordering a study give me a report back about how we could rewrite those jobs back. It could be something as granular as that, but it would re typically require board action. Um, oh, Jim, I didn't see you, come on. Uh, we had Mary Beth introduce herself at the beginning. Uh, Jim, why don't you just say hi to everybody since we have another, another SEMA board member. Hello everyone, um, I am Jim Piazza. I work for Valley, Valley Medical, <laughs> I'm your SEMA treasurer. Um, and uh, you're in, in time, just, just in time to say goodbye. I guess you can, you, you did just private message me, Jim. Yeah, if you want, you can talk about looking at a new site. Sure, I've been here for a little bit, so I've been, you guys are doing a great job and covering everything, so thank you all. Um, just so everyone knows that uh, the SEMA site on, Al, on the Alameda um, is, we've had this forever. Uh, 74, I think, is or somewhere in there. It's been there for a long time. Um, so we've been, we've grown. So we've been looking at a new, or looking for a new location. We haven't quite solidified one yet, but we have some op some options on our table that we're looking at. Um, but SEMA is actively looking for a new location that's centrally located, so that we're not going towards SSA or HHS or some other, you know, downtown. It's kind of central, so we take all of our members' locations into account that we can have a, a bigger and nicer meeting hall, and have more of these site type meetings and. And you know those kinds of interviews. I don't know if you've been to a current one, but um, it has some opportunities. <laughs> it's a little weathered, I think. It might be. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Zab. Thank oh. you. <laughs> so I apologize. My boss is calling. Adam, can you handle the rest of the meeting? So yep. that's. I just want to let everybody know that hey, in Chandler, the upcoming, we'll be talking about it, um, and you'll get more information as we solidify the location. So thank you. Okay, I'm putting in my headset. Give me just one second. Hey, hey, you'll Zeb, be happy to know we just had 101 Zeb, Zeb, people at the site. Can you meeting. mute yourself, Zeb? Oh, that's great. Hey. All right. I need to mute Zeb. Sorry, folks. Oh, that's not Tim. That is... Uh... Okay, Zeb's muted. <laughs> um, last thing, we only got a couple minutes left and I see some folks dropping off. I just wanted to ask real quick for folks' perspective, um, as, as a large group of people, many of whom have been working on site through the entirety of the pandemic, um, how, how would folks feel specifically about um, any of our HHS, VMC, other hospital site meetings going back to in-person, uh, presumably going back to that lower BQ conference room we used to do in, in January. Is that something folks would, would feel comfortable with? Um, I assume we'd get a number of people that we can appropriately distance and, and mask and all that kind of stuff. Um, would you exclusively just want to continue to attend remotely by Zoom? So not relevant for you. Um, interested to hear any feedbacks, any feedback folks have. 
oh, the conference room is still the vaccine clinic. Oh, yeah, some, some other large conference room. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, I'm getting a lot of direct and general messages saying prefer prefer Zoom. Uh, okay. Maybe Adam and the possibility of a hybrid. Oh, so we're we're, we're definitely going to do hybrid. Um, so I think what we what we might do is we'll give it a shot if it's us and like two other people there. You know, maybe we'll just keep it full time Zoom. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have it hybrid for the foreseeable future, probably for the rest of eternity because COVID's never going to leave, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, folks. We'll, we'll, we'll take this feedback into account as we're deciding what to, uh, what to do. It was good to see everybody. Hope you all had a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Hope everyone has a happy holidays um, and gets to spend some time with their families. Take care and best wishes. See you, folks. Happy holidays, all. Hi, Chad. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, Mary Beth.